Did you know that Greenwich Village used to be home to two notorious prisons, one the first ever in New York State, and that two villagers played a critical role in one of the biggest prison uprisings in American history, leading to a slew of long overdue prison reforms? Welcome to Off the Grid, Village Preservation's podcast based on our blog of the same name. Off the Grid podcast is a great way for us to share news, commentary, trivia, and historic information about Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. We hope you'll become an avid listener and share with friends, neighbors, and family. African-American, feminist, and LGBTQ solidarity at the Women's House of Detention. The Women's House of Detention, an 11-story prison in the center of Greenwich Village, closed on June 13, 1971. The prison was located at this site between Greenwich Avenue, 6th Avenue, Christopher Street, and West 10th Street for 39 years, beginning in 1932. Over the course of its lifetime, countless radical, revolutionary, transgressive, and, quote, obscene individuals passed through its doors. Many of those imprisoned were women of color, queer women, and gender nonconforming people who have throughout history been arrested in disproportionately high numbers. Though the Women's House of Detention was demolished by 1974, activists and scholars continue to recall the prison's important history. It was, all at once, a building where extreme brutality and violence occurred, a place where queerness was made visible, and a significant site of solidarity and protest across the Black power, feminist, and LGBTQ rights movements. During the years of the prison's operation, LGBTQ people, especially LGBTQ people of color, could be stopped by the police or arrested for very little or nothing at all. In the 1950s and 1960s, police were especially violent when raiding mafia-run bars serving lesbian patrons in the neighborhood, such as the Sea Colony and the Bagatelle. Many of the individuals arrested in these raids were brought to the Women's House of Detention. At the same time, the prison's proximity to the rest of the neighborhood allowed those who were imprisoned here to maintain connections to the neighborhood. Polly Thistlewaite, the interim university dean for library services at CUNY, writes, quote, For queer women, the prison simultaneously served as a cautionary tale about how society disciplined those who broke its rules and provided some of the clearest evidence that it was possible to break those rules and survive. Unquote. In her book, Zami, A New Spelling of My Name, the Black lesbian activist and poet Audre Lorde remembers, quote, Across the village street in the early summer dusk, a handful of impatient husbands and lovers stood, calling back and forth to unseen but well-heard inmates within the grated windows of the women's house of detention on the west side of Greenwich Avenue. Information and endearments flew up and down, the conversants apparently oblivious to the ears of the passers-by as they discussed the availability of lawyers, the length of stay, family, conditions, and the undying quality of true love. The Women's House of Detention, right smack in the middle of the village, always felt like one up for our side, a defiant pocket of female resistance, ever present as a reminder of possibility as well as punishment." Unquote. Almost exactly two years before the prison closed, the Stonewall riots erupted just down the street from the Women's House of Detention on June 28, 1969. That evening, the police conducted one of their many raids on the Stonewall Inn, a bar that served gay patrons, and the patrons fought back. The protests, incited in part by the Black trans activist Marsha P. Johnson, are credited with launching the modern LGBTQ rights movement. What is less known, however, is that the people held in the Women's House of Detention were an essential part of this historic moment. In 2019, Thistlewaite published an essay in honor of Stonewall's 50th anniversary titled, Where Were the Lesbians in the Stonewall Riots? The Women's House of Detention and Lesbian Resistance. According to the various accounts Thistlewaite cites to answer this question, hundreds of lesbians were imprisoned at the Women's House of Detention the night and week of the Stonewall Riots, where they cheered on the protesters. 
Doric Wilson, she writes, quote, told Stonewall Chronicler David Carter that the Saturday night of the riots, he saw red sparks falling from on high through the night air as in a gentle rainfall. The prisoners were setting toilet paper on fire and dropping it from their cell windows to show support for the rioters, unquote. Meanwhile, Thistleway asserts, most of the female protesters arrested at Stonewall ended up being jailed inside the Women's House of Detention. Author and queer historian Hugh Ryan also refers to the Daughters of Belitis member Arcus Flynn's account of the riots, in which she recalls that the imprisoned women chanted, quote, gay power, gay power, from the House of Detention. According to Ryan, Black Panther Party member Afeni Shakur, who is the mother of Tupac Shakur, was one of the women inside the prison at this time. She had been arrested for her participation in the so-called Panther 21, members of the party accused of plotting to bomb New York landmarks and department stores. Following the momentum of the Stonewall riots, a group within the Mattachine Society, one of the earliest American gay rights organizations, wanted to protest against the Women's House of Detention in support of Shakur and Joan Byrd, also alleged to be part of the Panther 21. When the Mattachine Society refused to participate in such an event, which they feared would cause conflict with the authorities, the group chose a new name, the Gay Liberation Front. From Christmas to New Year's of 1969, Ryan writes, the GLF, which became one of the most significant organizations of the LGBTQ movement, took part in organizing around-the-clock protests of the prison. The following year, when Shakur's charges were dropped, she attended a workshop at the Black Panther Party's 1970 Revolutionary Constitutional Convention, led by the Gay Liberation Front. Together, she and the other workshop members developed a list of demands for the convention floor, emphasizing the necessity of gay and feminist liberation in the Black Power movement. Needless to say, the roots of this conversation began in the heart of Greenwich Village in the organizing that occurred against the Women's House of Detention. The intimate links between parts of the LGBTQ rights movement and the Black Power movement continued to grow. The long list of notable figures who were imprisoned at the Women's House of Detention across its years of operation also includes Ethel Rosenberg, Dorothy Day, Andrea Dworkin, Valerie Solanas, and Angela Davis. Both Dworkin and Davis wrote about their mistreatment and the abuse they witnessed and experienced in the House of Detention. And in 1967, Sarah Harris published her book, Hellhole, the shocking story of the inmates and life in the New York City House of Detention for Women, which detailed the deplorable conditions as well as individual interviews of the people imprisoned here. These accounts aided in the calls for the closure of the overcrowded prison which faced ongoing allegations of racial discrimination, abuse, and mistreatment. Still, when the last imprisoned people were transferred from the Women's House of Detention to a new facility on Rikers Island in 1971, 200 people gathered in protest. According to the New York Times account, the demonstrators argued the transfer would isolate those who were imprisoned from their community and weaken protections against institutional violence. They knew that the closing of the House of Detention did not signify the end of imprisonment for the community's people, but simply removed it from sight. Nearly 50 years later, the necessity of remembering the prison's history, the human rights abuses it perpetuated, and the cross-movement solidarity and protests that developed in resistance to it remains absolutely imperative. The Village Big House. It was not really a house. When one has the occasion to think about incarceration in the village, many long-time residents would likely recall the Women's House of Detention we just heard about, an imposing building that loomed over Jefferson Market Courthouse from 1932 to 1974. However, well over 100 years before the Women's House of Detention came into being, the village was home to New York State's first state prison. Extending over four acres of land between today's Christopher and Perry Streets and Washington Street and the Hudson River shoreline, the Greenwich, or Newgate State Prison, was constructed in 1796 to 1797. The plans for the prison were crafted by architect Joseph Francois Mangan, 
who would later go on to design New York City's City Hall building and the old St. Patrick's Cathedral on the Lower East Side. Newgate was New York State's first prison and was directed by Quaker philanthropist and politician Thomas Eddy, who hoped to help reform the city and state's penal system. As the Landmarks Preservation Commission designation report for the Weehawken Street Historic District notes, an observer in 1801 wrote, A more pleasant, airy, and salubrious spot could not have been selected in the vicinity of New York, and the prison, as one of the area's most imposing structures, became one of Greenwich's first tourist attractions. The prison's location north of the then city center and on the Hudson River is thought to have helped generate the well-known phrase, sent up the river, as a euphemism for incarceration, well before the prison's successor Sing Sing Prison was built significantly further north up the Hudson River. Unsurprisingly, problems of overcrowding and poor conditions arose almost immediately after the prison's construction, and the designation report goes on to describe, Despite the state prison's reform reputation, a number of insurrections occurred that were accompanied by attempts to burn the buildings. Many of the Newgate prisoners were West Indian and had a history of opposition to white supremacy and expressions of authority. Stephen Allen, then recently the mayor of New York City, from 1821 to 1824, was appointed as commissioner to recommend changes in the state prison system in 1824. Among his recommendations was the closing of Newgate in favor of constructing a new prison farther north along the Hudson River at Sing Sing, later Ossining, New York. The city of New York acquired the Newgate State Prison from the state in 1826, and prisoners were moved to Sing Sing in 1828 to 1829. The Newgate land was plotted and sold by the city in 1829. However, it reserved the block front along West Street between Christopher and Amos Streets for a public market. After closing, the prison was briefly repurposed as a sanatorium, spa, and eventually some of the buildings of the old prison were incorporated into a brewery complex. Today, none of the original prison structures stand. The Attica Prison Riots and the Village the Attica Prison Riots, which took place September the 9th through the 13th, 1971, rocked the entire country. The bloodiest prison disturbance in recent American history, the riot was unplanned, but ignited at a time of deep unrest among the prison population. The prisoners spent the four days of the riot and uprising in negotiations for better conditions, dignity, and access to their loved ones. In that process, they called upon a select few to act as observers, including two villagers. These two men, David Rothenberg and William Kunstler, were well known for their social justice work, with former prisoners and in the courtroom, respectively. Their work continues to inspire movements in the ongoing fights for human rights and justice, legacies which run deeply in the streets and hearts of Greenwich Village. A brief background on the Attica riots and uprising. In September 1971, there were nearly 1,300 inmates in the Attica Correctional Facility in upstate New York. The riot was sparked on September 9, 1971, by long standing and ongoing complaints about human rights abuses by guards and officials and inhumane conditions in which the prisoners were housed within the prison. That summer, inmates wrote a list of 27 grievances, which were ignored, but would be revisited as part of their negotiations following the uprising. When the uprising happened, the days following involved intense negotiations between officials and the prisoners, who had taken 42 hostages in the initial hours of the riot. When negotiations began on September 10th, the prisoners demanded the presence of outside onlookers, lawyers, and others to ensure that there were third-party, sympathetic eyes on the process, and that the inmates' rights would be considered and respected. This team of observers included journalists, elected officials, and two villagers, prison abolition and community support worker David Rothenberg and civil rights lawyer William Kunstler. Village awardee David Rothenberg, Attica observer and prison abolitionist. 
David Rothenberg began his career as a producer and publicist for productions on and off Broadway at many village theaters. In 1966, he read a script that would change everything. The play, which he produced at a village theater, was called Fortune and Men's Eyes, and was written by a formerly incarcerated playwright named John Herbert. This play inspired Rothenberg to found the Fortune Society, to advocate for people impacted by the criminal justice system. David was one of the few outside observers who was invited into the yard at Attica, surrounded by over a thousand incarcerated individuals and 42 guards they had held hostage. Although Attica ended tragically, it succeeded in raising public awareness of the horrors of the prison system, and further raised David's profile and the stature of the Fortune Society as one of the few organizations willing to speak on behalf of those directly impacted by the criminal justice system. The Fortune Society attracted a new influx of volunteers and clients after the Attica riots and significantly expanded its operations. In the decades following, the Fortune Society continued to grow under David's leadership, increasing the number of clients served each year and building a broader base of funding. Rothenberg has lived in the village for over 50 years, and while he has since retired, the Fortune Society continues its important work. David Rothenberg was the subject of an oral history with Village Preservation in 2017, which you can access on our website and appears on our civil rights and social justice map. William Kunstler, villager and civil rights lawyer, Preeminent radical lawyer Bill Kunstler, whose home and office was located for years at 13 Gay Street, defended the rights of the most controversial of clients until his death in 1995. Kunstler was famous for representing Freedom Riders, Black Panthers, and the Chicago Eight, later the Chicago Seven. Bill represented leaders of the American Indian Movement, who occupied Wounded Knee in 1973, and along with his partner Ron Kuby, he also represented Youssef Salam, one of the Central Park Five, teens of color coerced by the police to give false confessions to a crime they didn't commit. In 2002, the Central Park Five were exonerated. Kunstler was an active member of the National Lawyers Guild, a board member of the American Civil Liberties Union, and also co-founded the Center for Constitutional Rights, the leading gathering place for radical lawyers in the country which was led for years by Michael Ratner, who lived at 124 Washington Place. Bill was asked to observe the 1971 Attica prison uprising and represent inmates who challenged the inhumane conditions at the prison. He spoke with the prisoners about their rights, strategies for negotiation, and how to speak to the press. As such a prominent radical lawyer, Kunstler was, of course, a polarizing figure, Many on the right wished to see him disbarred, while many on the left admired him as a symbol of justice and law. Legal writer Sidney Zion is quoted saying that Kunstler was one of the few lawyers in town who knows how to talk to the press. His stories always check out and he's not afraid to talk to you. And he's got credibility. Although you've got to ask sometimes, Bill, is that really true? Kunstler also appears on our civil rights and social justice map which you can access at www.gvshp.org slash civil rights map. The end of the takeover and after Attica. On Monday, September 13th, 1971, tear gas was dropped into the Attica prison yard and state police troopers opened fire nonstop for two minutes into the smoke. Hostages and inmates who were not resisting were among the victims of the indiscriminate shooting. Former police officers were among the participants in the raid, a decision called inexcusable by the commission established by New York State Governor Rockefeller to study the riot and its aftermath. In all, nine hostages and 29 inmates were killed during the assault, while a tenth hostage died a month later of gunshot wounds received during the assault. Additionally, one officer was fatally injured at the start of the uprising, and four inmates were subject to vigilante killings. The New York State Special Commission on Attica, in its report, said, With the exception of Indian massacres in the late 19th century, 
The state police assault, which ended the four-day prison uprising, was the bloodiest one-day encounter between Americans since the Civil War. After the Attica uprising, the New York State Department of Corrections began a grievance procedure for imprisoned people to have a voice in their experiences of imprisonment. Systems were also put in place to ensure that inmates can send and receive mail, one of the prisoners' complaints at Attica, and that prison leadership keeps connected and organized to avoid major conflicts. The treatment of prisoners is an ongoing issue in America, a country that is home to 4% of the world population, but 22% of the world's prisoners. And so the legacy of Attica lives on. The Attica uprising is often credited as birthing the modern-day prisoners' rights movement, including the Fortune Society. The work of villagers Rothenberg and Kunstler, and others, especially one-time villager Angela Davis, who spent time at the Women's House of Detention in the spot that is now the Jefferson Market Garden, shaped the prison abolition, prisoner support, and legal justice movements immeasurably. Thanks for listening to this episode of Off the Grid Podcast. Village Preservation was founded in 1980 to preserve the architectural heritage and cultural history of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. Village Preservation is a membership organization and relies on your support. Go to www.villagepreservation.org slash donate to join or contribute. You can delve further into any subject on our podcast at villagepreservation.org slash blog. And don't forget to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Till next time on Off the Grid, be well.